Well, we've come to the point where we discuss what I consider to be one of the most important decisions that we make in a, in a lifetime of saving and investing. And really, it's kind of two decisions. The first decision is going to be about uh, at what point are you going to say, I have enough to retire? And, uh, and when you get to that point, based on the amount that you have, are you going to be using a what we call a fixed distribution or a flexible distribution? Now, we spent uh, the last session talking about the fixed distribution. And before I turn Daryl and Chris loose on this, on this discussion, I would like to, to, to go back and look just for a few seconds, few minutes, at those tables that we looked at last week uh, and using the fixed distribution. Uh, and by the way, before we get there, I want to just make, make sure for, for first-timers uh, that you understand that uh, Chris Pedersen is uh, with us here. He is our director of research at the foundation. Uh, he is the author of uh, Two Funds for Life, uh, as well as uh, creating the best-in-class ETFs uh, for our website. And Daryl is the director of analytics, Daryl Balls. And uh, Daryl has recently uh, finished the over 200 uh, tables that uh, that that we use to try to uh, help people understand the implications of the the forks in the road that that we might take and there are some huge forks we're talking about right here and so uh, I'm going to start if I might for a few minutes before uh, Daryl uh, takes you into the uh, flexible distribution tables. I want to talk about what we did last time. We talked about a strategy of taking money out in retirement that was uh, based on saving enough, uh, having enough that you can retire now. I, I've talked to so many people that have got a number, and when they get to that number, they're, they're quitting, and they're going to take the next step in their life and that number typically is enough to support a distribution rate, let's say, of, of 3 or 4%, uh, hopefully for a lifetime. And they, they, they don't want to work any longer than to get to that number. And so, in a sense, when you retire and you have enough by taking out 4% and being able to adjust for retirement, it is what these tables that we call the fixed distribution. In this particular case, we're looking at the S&P 500 as the equity portfolio, and we have the same table except using other equity combinations. Now, you'll notice down the far right-hand side is an inflation rate, consumer price index. Whatever we take out, and in this particular case, we're starting with 30000 out of a million-dollar portfolio, it's got to go up as long as there is inflation. It could go down, but that doesn't happen very often. And so we can see on this table that over the years, that to replicate that $30,000 in spending power takes a lot more money. In fact, you can see out, if you go out 30 years, it takes $130,000 to replace what you could buy with $30,000 uh, in, uh, uh, in 1970. So this portfolio has one very important uh, a characteristic to it. Number one, it's enough to meet your enough needs, uh, and it's got enough uh, uh, growth in it that it should also be able to take care of inflation. And some of this inflation was over 10% during uh, this earlier part of the last 53 years. And you would notice that 
in all cases, uh, when you're taking out the $30,000 that you got to the bottom of the page. And even if you did 40,000, you would find in all but maybe one column, maybe the 100% bonds uh, might not have made it uh, to the bottom of the page. Uh, but if we take 50,000 out, it's a whole different situation. At 50,000, and I'll wait till I till you've got it up. You got 40 there now, Daryl. There we go. Thank you. At 50,000, we have a definite problem, particularly if we retired at age 40 and expected this portfolio to take care of us uh, with inflation adjustments uh, for the 53 years. It didn't make it. And in fact, by the end of the 30 years, virtually uh, all of the portfolios are gone. And, and this, is, this is radical, and it doesn't happen overnight, and so people adjust. So uh, we're not suggesting that people wouldn't do something other than just uh, sit there and run out of money. But it does show you, if we follow the math, this is the risk that you take if you take out too much. Enter the flexible, uh, the flexible distribution strategy. And before I dig into that, Daryl, would you put up uh, uh, an example of the flexible distribution and just walk through how you constructed this table? Because it is a slightly different a set of numbers. Sure. So for the flexible distribution table, um, we start off again with the initial one hundred or initial one million dollar investment. Only this time we take out a set percentage of the account at the beginning of every year. In the case of this table that's showing here, is three percent. Um, like we did with the fixed distributions, we use the returns from the fine tune fine tuning table which are here. So as an example, to walk you through, let's take the 50-50 portfolio, 50 S&P 500, 50 bonds, in 1970 earned 10%. So if we go and we look at the 50% equity, 50% bonds columns on this table here, you can see that we took out $30,000, which was 3% of a million, which dropped the initial portfolio balance at the beginning of the year to $970,000. And then at the end of the year, after earning 10%, it's about $1,067,000. For each year, we do the same thing. We increment by inflation. Or no, we don't. We increment the, I'm sorry. We increment the, the distribution by 3%. Um, and then, uh, do the same thing, subtract from the beginning of the year balance, apply the growth, and then we accumulate the distributions here. So uh, we've done that for both the 50-50, well, the 50-50, 40-60, 60-40, and 100% equity. And then each table shows the S&P 500 index as kind of a reference. And then down at the bottom is the Ending portfolio balance after 53 years. If you're interested in 30 years, you can look up here, up here, or if you're, whoops, well, if you're interested in 20 years, you can look here. Um, here is your final balance, or your final balance, your final withdrawal, and your total withdrawals. And we've done that for um, all the nine portfolios and for withdrawal rates that vary from 3% a year to 6% a year. So thanks, Daryl. I think that's it. No, I think that's great. I mean, it's uh, um, because we need, because each one is a separate return, uh, we need three columns to, to, to demonstrate the, the impact over this 53 years. But I think the 40, 60, 50, 50, 60, 40, uh, portfolios as equity and bonds, those are pretty common combinations for people in retirement. And for those who just want to see what it looks like, if you went pedal to the metal, we include the 100% equity. But here is what is different about the use 
of this particular approach to taking distributions. In the case of the fixed, remember we had enough. But what happens if instead of retiring with enough, and my wife and I went through this, I could have retired sooner uh, with enough, but we decided because of the things we wanted to be able to do with the money that we had each year, we decided we wanted to, to save more than enough. And so if in fact you save, let's say instead of saving a million, you saved $2 million. But let's say your cost of living for your needs, I'm not talking about for your, your desires, but in order to meet your cost, basic cost of living, that that 40,000, two people have that same need, but one has $2 million instead of one. Now it's obvious they have a huge advantage, but one of the advantages they have is instead of tying their distributions to, re, to, to inflation, they can ignore inflation. Now you can see uh, in this particular case that, that Daryl was talking about here with the S&P 500 and starting with $30,000 in the 50-50, you can see there are, there's a time where the payout, because the market wasn't doing well, was going down. In fact, uh, in 1970, you paid out 30000 and then after a lot of inflation, you find yourself in 1975, again, basically paying out $30,000. That is not going to work if you need that inflation adjustment. But if you had $2 million instead of one, and a forty a thirty thousand dollar need, you would, if you took out three percent, have a sixty thousand dollar distribution. And the the beauty here is that over time, going to a flexible distribution, it, it it's defense, defense, defense. It's defense as the market declines, you take out less. When you don't take out less, if you increase the distribution, you are punishing your portfolio at a time that it doesn't need to be punished. And so it is fascinating to me what happens over a period of time in terms of how much you took out and to spend and how much you left to others. If you remember last week, one of the things we ran into time and time again was that we were taking out too little and the errors were getting too much. But this strategy, if we go to the bottom of that page, Daryl, uh, where you're taking out the 3%, you end up over that entire period taking out a total of over $12 million. Now, when I look at the other one, we just, the fixed one, that one took out a total of $6.4 million. So the first thing that happened, even without doubling uh, the size of the portfolio, but by being able to use this kind of a flexible distribution, protected you in the down periods, left you with more money when the market recovered, and that was the long-term impact. Much higher distributions, but then there's probably going to be some sort of a sacrifice, theoretically, on the other side, what's left over for your family? Well, guess what? In the uh, fixed distribution, it was $27 plus million, and here it's $18 million. So I'm not going to say this is perfect for everybody, but I can say that it using this approach, if you can afford to ignore inflation, uh, then you have the ability, well, number one, to spend more money. But if we looked uh, at the next table here uh, under this particular combination, and let's see which one you're going to use, Daryl. I can't see the top of it. If you could scroll down, thank you. In this case, we're going to jump forward 
and ignore the 4% because it's going to be more of the same. But where the magic starts is with the 5% distribution. Remember when we looked before, by the end of 30 years, every column was out of money. Now we look at columns that all make it to the bottom of the page. And the, the, the portfolios are the same, same equity, same fixed income. All that is different is the strategy that you use to take distributions. So what, what do we see? Well, the first thing is you don't run out of money by the end of 1999. And, and in fact, in the 50%, 50-50 strategy, you've got about $6 million. And you've had about $3.4 million in distributions. And by the way, I might uh, also mention, well, I'm look, not right now, I'll do it later, but look now down at the bottom, if you will, Daryl. At the, at the end of, of the of the 53-year period, you've still got about $6 million. And you have taken out $9.7 million in distributions. So there is a huge payoff. And I think about the college seniors I'm going to be talking to uh, on the 24th of May in, at Western in Bellingham, Washington. And the question is, you know, what, what is your plan going to be thinking in terms of how do you, how much do you want to save? Because, you know, people want to save as little as they have to because the rest of the money they have to enjoy their life. And I'm going to push them a little bit to understand that maybe. And I've said this before, planning for enough can be a big problem when you have problems along the way that uh, enough turns out not to be enough. But planning actually in the beginning to have more than enough uh, in order to support a flexible distribution is uh, it's a great thing to do if you have the ability to put the money away to do it. And obviously, people who make a lot of money find it easier to do this than people who aren't. So there's uh, there are obviously those kinds of challenges. Now, you can also notice, just looking at the bottom here, that by moving over to the 60-40, 60% equity, 40% fixed income, instead of ending up with $6 million, you end up with $7 million. Instead of distributions of 9.7, you end up with distrib- 9.7 million. You end up with distributions of 10.4 million. And here is another advantage to the person who has oversaved. It isn't just that you could take more out of any particular column. It's also that you could move a column over maybe even two. I mean, it may be the difference between having a 40-60 and having a 60-40. At the 40-60, you ended up with about $5 million. And with the 60-40, you end up with about $7 million at the end of the 53 years. And, and, And by the way, you'll notice it's interesting. At the end of 30 years, the differences are not quite as big, but they're still significant. Significant from five million to to uh, six million to uh, almost seven million. I think these these tables are, are 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 dynamite in terms of playing what ifs, and obviously the big what if is the sequence of events, and of course the 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 beauty is that. Uh, as I hope that uh, that uh, Chris will uh, discuss a little bit, is being able to test these kinds of situations uh, uh, with uh, the, the uh, calculator that we have on our site. But before we do that, before we do that, I would like to also go, uh, Daryl, to the 6% distribution. Because with flexible, uh, and I'm not sure every advisor would be encouraging people to take out 6% because uh, it's always known as a number that you're going to go broke. But at 6%, 
uh, over the 30-year period, uh, you are able, in the 50-50, you end up with about $4 million, more than $4 million at the end of 30 years. And at the end of 53 years, you end up with about $3.4 million. It is, it is pushed in the portfolio to take out six. And what happens there is you don't necessarily take out more money over a lifetime because actually at the bottom here, you will have taken out less money because when you leave more money in to grow and to, and, and to, and to multiply because of the additional money left in the portfolio, it allows you later in life to take out more. But a lot of people may not see themselves later in life having this kind of an opportunity. I can tell you at age 79, I am not the least bit interested in 59 years worth of data or 53. I'm 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 looking, I'm looking at the first decade. That's about it. So uh I just think this is a powerful set of numbers. Now we also know, and we don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but Daryl, let's go to the four fund strategy because you, we all know this is with the, the most conservative of the portfolios that we have in terms of that underlying portfolio. The S&P 500 is the, the highest quality of all of the individual asset classes that we put together. Now we make a case as best we can, that the additional risk, if there is even additional risk in the four fund equity portfolio, it's 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 very small additional risk, if at all, given enough time. But what we do know from from the past of the at these kinds of tables we've looked at, we're going to have more money to spend and more money to leave. Let's just look out thirty years. In this particular case, you're at uh, 13 million with the 50-50. You're at 15 million with the 60-40. If we go to the bottom of the page, we are at 20, 28 million with the 50-50 and 35 million. And by the way, you took out a lot more money. Yeah, that just the one thing to point out, Paul. Here, the the twenty seven that's left here at the fifty fifty is the same twenty seven that was left with the fifty fifty in the S and P five hundred, but you took out six thousand six million dollars more. Terrific. Uh, and this is what's the percentage uh, we're taking out here? Three percent. Um. Uh. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you're right. Yeah, it exact almost exactly the same. And 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 so it it isn't just how much we had along the way, it it is how much it grew. It's also how much we get to spend and give away. And uh, uh and so these are big, big decisions. Um let's just take one more of these. Let's go to whatever you have is the next one, five percent. Because we ran out of money at the 5% level with some of the U.S. four fund strategy columns uh, with the fixed. But, but here we go all the way to the bottom, lots of money distributed. Uh, and, and you at home who might want to compare these, uh, you've got the tables. Take a look at the comparable tables, not only of the S&P 500. Uh, versus the uh, four fund, you might even want to take a look uh, at the uh, at the two fund strategy, uh, the 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 two value funds, small and large, or the two fund strategy with the S and P five hundred and small cap value, and see what those numbers look like at thirty and and uh, fifty three years out. So these are in. It's a kind of intentional thinking that when you're young in this process, if you could get your your, your arms around this, uh, both uh, commitment-wise, emotionally, 
and hopefully to be able to do the right things in terms of making the good investment decisions. Because if, if we can get this information in the hands of somebody in their 20s, if they see the advantage of one particular set of equity asset classes, and they do that for 40 years, if they have a glide path, and we'll be talking about glide paths uh, in the coming weeks, if they have a glide path that isn't too conservative, and if they've been a good saver along the way, that is a mighty powerful combination. And uh, if, if young people don't know this kind of thinking is, or these kinds of decisions are there to be made, I'm not sure that they'll, that they'll just happen to stumble over. And I think that somehow they have to learn about this and put this into action. Now, Daryl, I think you had actually developed a, a, a table that compared very easily uh, uh, several different uh, uh, distribution situations. Yes, I put together a table that looked at, this is for the S&P 500, fixed distribution 30,000 a year and uh, in, adjusted for inflation, compares it with the S&P 500 portfolio, same portfolio, flexible distribution, starting out at 3% of a million dollar portfolio. So, and this is the 50, 50 equity, 50 fixed income. You can see that, that your initial distribution in each case is $30,000. Your year end balance after the first year is $1.067 million. And then things start to change. Um, the, ta- the distributions on the left are adjusted for inflation. The distributions on the right are 3% of the previous year ending balance. So you, as you go through the year, you can see how in the, the second Second distribution is 30, almost 32,000. Second distribution for the flexible is about 32,000. Uh, third year is about 33,000. For the fixed, it's about 35,000 for the flexible. So you get more with the flexible. Similar thing happens in the fourth year, almost 34,000 with the fixed, 38,000 almost with the flexible. Then something bad happens in 74. In, in the fixed distribution, you get 37,000 in the flexible, you get 34. Next year gets even worse. You get 30, where the fixed distribution is 41. This goes on for 12 years before with before the flexible distribution ends up taking out more than the fixed distribution. So things things are are there uh, the flexible distribution approach is not without risk. And that's where Paul's point of of Using it with an oversaving, such oversaved situation. The worst year in here, 1982, where you you took out 51,000 in the flexible, and the fixed was taking out 75,000 almost. That's a that's a 33 percent, almost a 33 percent cut in real dollars when using the flexible distribution. That's to Paul's point that if you have a million and a half let's say, start it out, let's say, then in 1982, you're taking out about the same amount, $74,000. If you have 2 million, then you're doing, you're still ahead of the, of your, your need of $30,000. The other thing is that, although it's not as easy to see on this table here is, there's a chance that over, over a period of time, your year to year growth in, with the flexible distribution uh, year to year growth in your distributions with the flexible distribution may not keep up with the inflation. The case in this case with the S and P 500 is the the 2000 aughts decade, the the lost decade, so to speak, for the S and P 500, where you started the year at 330 decade at 332k and ended up in 2009 taking out 294k. Whereas the fixed distribution is just chunking along, taking out his inflation to adjusted amount every time. But those flexible distribution numbers are an awful lot bigger. They are. They are. But the, the difference is this is 30 years in. OK. And so you've been taking this out all along and you say, I need 30,000. I need 30,000. Yeah. But I'm taking out 114. I'm taking out 169. Yeah. I only need 30,000, but I could do a lot with that. So you, start having lifestyle. Well, actually, your, 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 your 
that you're. Let me come at it a different way. So I see what you're saying. You know, if you scale your lifestyle and and you you get used to spending that much on yourself, that's an issue. But I think for a lot of people who oversave, um, it's really a question of whether I'm giving to my kids while I'm alive or when I'm dead. Or if I'm giving to charity when I'm alive or when I'm dead. And you look at the fixed distribution strategy and you leave a big pile of money when you're dead. You look at the flexible distribution strategy and you have the opportunity when the market is up to be a little more generous with charities and with your kids. Absolutely. And if that's what you're doing with the extra money, then when you have a tight year and you know the market is down, hopefully your kids understand that this isn't the year they're getting a gift and the charities do as well. So I think if you're an oversaver who is charitably or gift minded, the pain you're pointing out here is easy to deal with. If you are a uh, a real consumer who wants to spend every penny on yourself and you have the capacity to do that, then there's more pain on the right potentially in these red boxes you're highlighting. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but the pain on the right may not be may may not be for yourself. Looking at thirty thousand dollars a year does not include a lot of of potential sources of expenses in your out years. There's a lot of things that are very expensive in your out years if you're not careful. And so if you're used to funding these on a cash flow basis in these outflow in these outer years, you can get bit here. The whole point here is not that either one of us is right or wrong. It's just that there are a lot of things to consider uh, when you look at this. But 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 Daryl, I, I gotta say we what happens when we don't show the the additional money? Uh, that table looks very different when it's two million dollars rather than one million on the right. Yes, yeah. Uh, and and then all of a sudden you're doubling those numbers you see right there. Yeah, one of the interesting things to think about is if you have if if you if you say your initial need is thirty thousand dollars and you're weighing a fixed versus flexible and you've oversaved, let's say by by fifty or a hundred percent. Um, one of the things to look at is comparing a a three percent fixed with a with a a five uh, percent, let's say, flexible. Yeah, and look at with with a oversaved amount. So comparing a million at three percent versus a million and a half at five percent, and that's something that would that would be very interesting to take a look at and see how they go. Um, and one of the things that that I think is is interesting about the flexible distribution is that because I think you can find a combination of uh, portfolio, potentially asset classes, and withdrawal rate that would allow you to maintain good uh, cash flow in the early years and potentially uh, deal with increased costs in the out years. Yeah. It looks like somebody has been look looking forward, at the calculator. I look forward to seeing Chris's demonstration with the calculator. Fire away, Chris. Oh, I th- uh, you haven't really talked about this chart yet, Daryl. Well, this is this is a, a chart that has essentially this shows essentially the same data, but it's in a graphical sense. The um, the blue line on here is the the annual distribution for a three percent fixed distribution. Here's that seventy thousand eight hundred one dollars and eighty two. The orange line is the three three uh, percent of the portfolio distribution uh, annually, and here's that fifty one thousand dollars. So here's the 12 years where you, if you were, were using the flexible versus the fixed, where, where your flexible distribution was actually less in real dollars than, than the investor who started out with a fixed distribution profile. Um, and then this point up here in the 2000s through the 2020s, uh, 2020 is the point where your inflation adjusted amount in 2000, in the year $2,000, let's say, is actually less for the next 19 years than it was in 2000. Now, to Chris's point, this is a lot, lot higher than this point here. It's a lot higher, okay? 
But the inflation from 2000 to 2020 and 2000 to 2020 uh, shows that this line never really caught back up to an inflation adjusted amount uh, until, until 20 years later. You had 19 years of taking out less than you took out uh, in year 2000. Now, in this particular case, that's not a big deal. What if this is your first year? And that's what Chris is going to talk about with the calculator. Go ahead, Chris. And, uh, oh, the one, sure. one more thing on this one, I guess, oh. is that <laughs> one more thing on this one is that this blue line here essentially represents inflation adjusted uh, year 1970 dollars. So this is these are nominal dollars, but this blue line is is real dollars essentially in 1970 dollars. So okay, so if we go to the website. To find the calculator, we come under best advice and we go down to the Merriman Lifetime Investment Calculator. And we can uh, take a look at all kinds of different stuff. But since we're playing around today with uh, these variable distribution strategies, I think that would be a good one to look at. So I'm going to pick the uh, Worldwide Ultimate Buy and Hold 50 50. And uh, in terms of I'm just going to keep it simple. We'll look at a 50-50 and 100% equity, and we'll leave the S&P 500 in there too. So, and then we'll make contributions zero, and we'll make distributions uh, flexible. But one of the things I want to do is come up here to, well, and we'll make the distributions start in year one, and we'll do distributions for 52 years because that's all he's got in here. And we'll, we'll start with the 4%. One of the things he has in here that's really useful is this ability to show nominal or real. So right now we have it set at nominal, which means that inflation applies to all of these numbers. Um, it's included in the investment returns. It's included in the, the distributions. Um, so we can see what's, what's going on as we go from 1970, that was our start year, to the end at 2021. That's as far as uh, Craig has the data in here for right now. And, these are very similar to the tables that Daryl laid out. You know, you've got your uh, your end of year balance, not your starting year, but your end of year balance, um, your distribution, and you can go down the table and see how how they happen. And you can see that, uh, you know, with this 50-50 stock portfolio, the distributions go up for a little bit, and then they go down in 1974, go down again in 1975. But the cool thing is um, you can come over here and you can switch from nominal to real. And now you can see what happened to the purchasing power of your distribution every year. And so you started out with $4,000, but by the time you got to 1975, you've got $3,000 of purchasing power. So to Daryl's point, with this variable distribution strategy, that's that's not that's not a happy that's not a happy camper unless you've oversaved. Now, if you started out with twice as much money as you needed, so you really can live on four thousand, and you got to take out eight thousand. By the time you're down to this twenty nine thirty five, which is fifty eight seventy, you only need four thousand to live. You're still okay, right? So if you've oversaved, it's all right. And you can scroll all the way to the bottom and you can you can see that uh, at the bottom of the chart with the 50-50 worldwide uh, ultimate buy and hold, you've got double, almost double what you started with in terms of purchasing power that you're taking out. Uh, taking out. Now that's at 52 years, which is unrealistic. So let's come back to 30 years. At 30 years, you, you still have uh, more than double actually, 82-82. So you've doubled your purchasing power. And if you were 100% equities, you've almost quadrupled your purchasing power. And it did much better than the S&P 500 did. Uh, so it's, it's kind of cool that you can do that. You can also come over here and change the start year. So what would happen if you started in 19, uh, what, was the, what was the year you had up there, Daryl? 2000. 
2000. All right, so we'll go to 2000. So here we go. Now the start, the start sequence is at 2000, and you see that your distributions go down, down, down for the first three years. But, you know, they come back up in a 50-50. Now, if you look at 100% stock, same thing. You start at 4,000, and then 36, 55, 33, 93, 29, 24. But then you're back above water. Um, but if you come all the way out to 20, 2009, you're underwater again. And I think that's the last time. Oh, no, no, no. You come down here to 19. Well, now it's looped around. So around, you can yeah. debate You can debate whether that's real or not. But, um, you it's know, it's a if sequence you, of if, returns, you know. Yeah. I mean, if you run into another period of high inflation, you know, it could it could bite you. So. It's a fun S&P thing to be able to play with. If you look at the S and P 500, which is what Daryl was. 2009. Uh, yeah, you're out to 2010, bucks. and you're still underwater. Yeah. Yeah, you go a long time. It's not. Yeah, it's not until 2021 that your withdrawal, your distribution, is back up to what you had hoped it was. So, I. Uh, so so where is the uh, function, the feature of uh, being able to modify the return across. The, uh, that's uh, over here. You you have to change, do, history. Do, change history right there. So I can't remember if this is positive or negative. If I go, uh, let's just put in a big number and see. So if I hit 5%, that improves things, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And if I go minus 10%, that should make everything worse. It did. Long yeah, okay. Bad. There we go. All right. So you could <laughs> so you could go more reasonable, go minus, say minus 1%. You're going to pay an advisor a 1% fee, right? Yeah. There you go. And then you can you can see exactly what the impact was. And I uh, it makes things it makes things worse. This 50-50 stock portfolio actually has a long, uh, many, many years out here, you know, to 2021 where you're not, you're not doing as well. Uh, those fees add up. They're important. You know, if you go down, I'm not sure you ever get back even. Nope. Go, go look at the bottom. Well, I mean, it is a looped history, so yeah, it does maybe. come back up. But uh, basically you have, we started out at the worst in 2020 and then we said we relived the 70s so it wasn't a great yeah. wasn't a great sequence now there are people who would say that realistically that might happen you know it could be that the fed fails to get inflation under control and we go through another period of tough inflationary uh times here you, you just don't know you don't know and that's probably one of the reasons why when you get right down to it uh most retirees they take all this information in and then they tend to be very conservative. I uh, I know in our case, we said we were going to follow a fixed distribution strategy. We said that, you know, we could do something under 4% and we felt like that was safe. But through the pandemic, we were way under 4%. We, we, uh, we really pulled our horns in and said, you know, this is not a good time to spend a lot of money. And when the market's down, we tend to withdraw less. And when the market's up, we tend to withdraw more. And I, I think retirees tend to be that way. As I tell my kids, you know, our, our strategy in retirement is to manage our finances so we don't have to move in with you. And they agree. They agree that that is the objective. And that means that to some extent, we're kind of self-insuring against long-term care. We're self-insuring against catastrophic medical expenses. We're self insuring you know. Talk about that, if you would, Chris, uh, some of the data that you have found regarding that. Well, yeah, let me just pop up and we can throw these links. Um, we can throw these links into uh, the the notes. So I, I, I did some Googling data today to figure out, well, what do real retirees do? And uh, this is on a, a blog called of dollars and data. Um, it's 
an advisor who works for Ritholtz, Nick um, Maggiuli. And he, he's done some posts that are really interesting about what people actually do in retirement. And I thought this quote was very interesting. And it's from the Investments of Wealth Institute work. Across all wealth levels, 58% of retirees withdraw less than their investments earn. Now, if you just pause for a second, think about an equity portfolio. It's going to pay maybe 2 2.3, dividend income. That means that these retirees, even if you have bonds in there, you know, you're probably not up to three. You're, you're going to, you're going to be living off a very small withdrawal rate and you're not going to draw on any of the principal and you're not going to be pulling, you're not going to be driving your wealth down (laughs) towards retirement or towards your death you're going to be keeping this very large nest egg. And why do people do that? Well, there was another piece of research I found that I thought was interesting that compared the um, the median net worth relative to, this is at uh, age 65, as you go through retirement in the United States versus Sweden. And the speculation in this paper was, well, people are self-insuring. You know, in Sweden, you know that if you end up in long-term care or you need big medical expenses, somebody's going to take care of you. In the United States, that's not always true. So people tend to keep a bigger buffer uh, because they're they're trying to uh, make sure that they don't have to move in with the kids, right? So very, very interesting data. And, um, you know, I think at the end of the day, all of the material we just covered is great grist for the mill. It's information that hopefully the people following us can take in and process and think about and and use to come to a, a, a reasonable solution for themselves. Well, let me ask you, if uh, what do you expect a young person should do or know or plan for uh, as a uh, on a lifetime basis? Do you think if they're planning out five or 10 years, that's pretty good? Or should they in fact have a goal for how much they're going to have when they retire? You know, I had a conversation with a young person about this who had followed our work very closely, who was saving into a broadly diversified portfolio aggressively at a young age. And So doing all of the things that we hope they would do, but the one piece I couldn't convince them of that, that I would really like to get young people to appreciate and understand. And I I see all kinds of media that says they don't quite get it is how much you need to have saved when you get to retirement and you are self-insuring for some of these risks, because the way he looks at it, he's got it made. He's going to have, I don't know, a million or $2 million when he gets to retirement. And that's plenty. Why would you need any more? You know, his lifestyle is, is constrained and it's small. He doesn't have a huge number of obligations and expenses. And he's got health insurance through his work. So I think, I think to young people, first of all, understanding the power of compounding and the importance of saving early, all of those things are really good. But then a lot of young people, I think, look at the the wealth that baby boomers have accumulated and think it's either unfair or exorbitant until you sit in the shoes of somebody who has to make sure that that's going to last a lifetime and it's going to cover for all of the unforeseen events. I think it's hard to appreciate what that insecurity feels like. And I, so that would be the thing I would, I would hope to be able to instill in a young person is just this idea that, you know, the older you get, the more of these responsibilities and obligations and things you have to cover yourself. And um, it's, uh, that's, that's not to say that some of us, you know, shouldn't be maybe more generous or spending more. <laughs> I think, I think some of us, Probably should, but uh, it's a tension. It's a really interesting tension that's hard to understand until you're in it. And yet, if this young person is uh, in his 20s. Yep. Uh, and he is saving relatively aggressively. Yep. 
And he's investing in equities. Yep. Is he using one of our combinations, one of our portfolios? I don't know exactly which portfolio, but I know that he's got a, a significant chunk in small cap value. What a surprise. Uh, and then maybe the idea he has the idea that a million or two will be plenty, but maybe actually he's on the road to five or six or seven or eight million. He just hasn't figured that out. Actually, I'm pretty sure he has figured figured oh. it out. He's probably taken because he he uses portfolio visualizer. He knows how to do Monte Carlo simulations. He's he's clever. He's clever, and uh, and he's paying attention to all that. I think the piece he hasn't thought about, and and we're maybe more familiar with it because of our lifetime of experience, is just how big inflation is. And how much more medical expenses could be and what it's like when, you know, you you have to self-insure in the gap years between when you retire and Medicaid and Medicare or Medic yeah, Medicaid is available. And, you know, well, and, and if you're going to self-insure for long term care, potentially could last a decade or more. Exactly. And, and you know, at, at 60, 70, 80, 100 thousand dollars a year today. In today's dollars, uh, that's a big chunk to swallow. Well, and who knows? He, you know, he may get married and have kids, and you know, have college expenses and all kinds of things that he's not anticipating right yeah. now. Yeah, that come up along the way. And houses may be more expensive than he's thinking. You know, right now he's happy in an apartment and doesn't think he needs a house, but that could change. You know, I mean, you just yeah. there's a lot of unforeseen stuff that can pop up. I have, a retired friend who's still, you know, I have a retired friend who's still renting and he's happy as a clam. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Well, that's all very interesting. And, and uh, uh, the, the challenge of our organization is to figure out how we make, how we make this information impactful. And and I know you guys are very thoughtful. I love the things you come up with to to uh, to, to to share your uh, your thoughts and your studies. Uh, but I hope we hear we have a, a lot of folks out there who probably have an idea or two of things they'd like to uh, see us do to make the the process clearer, cleaner, and uh, easier. So uh, by the way, we'll be talking about that. Uh, Chris, I think uh, we're our next uh, meeting is about two funds for life, right? All set. Yeah, looking forward to it. I'm excited. That's very that's very exciting. And do you have any new material from for the presentation? The slides are uh, they're they'll be familiar to people who know two funds for life, but I have tried to make it one of the simplest explanations we will have done, and also one that addresses the most frequently asked questions. Let's put it that way. So oh. I th I think I think we'll have about a half hour of walking through material, and then you and I can have a conversation for fifteen to twenty minutes, whatever makes sense, and I right, should be fun. And I think it provides an interesting contrast to the process that we've just been through because uh, the process we've just been through provides a huge amount of information and a lot of steps to choose in deciding what to do and then a lot of steps in actually doing it. And what we'll do with Two Funds for Life is an alternative that requires far fewer steps and gets you can get you to very much almost the same place. Yep. Okay. That's terrific. Well, thank you, Chris. Daryl, thank you. Great work as always. And uh, and thank you, the folks who are out there uh, taking this all in. We certainly hope that it's a life changer uh, at, or at least a challenger uh, in, uh, in, in what you're doing and how to maximize uh, your financial future in a way, hopefully, that means reducing your risk at the same time as it increases peace of mind. So uh, share this, if you will, with your friends. Uh, we know that it's helpful if you'll subscribe uh, to the video uh, uh, channel that, that, that gets us in higher rating territory so more people see us. And always 
uh, fun when you ask us a question uh, within these uh, video, the comment section. Uh, it gives us a chance to share those answers with you and with others who might have the same question. So thank you all very much and all the best to you and your family. Thanks, guys.